so yes uh, dear all uh, uh, i mean participants and all of you who will be watching this uh, uh, recording so greetings this is uh, somava basu president and founder of the council for global cooperation cgc and i would like to warmly welcome everyone to our today's session our today's session we are back again with another book discussion today's discussion as we know we would be focusing on a new book by professor harold james entitled seven crashes the economic crisis that shaped globalization seven crashes was published by yale university press in may of this year and harold james uh, in this extraordinary book presents a new economic history of financial crisis showing how some led to greater globalization while others kept nations apart uh, J james in his book unfolds how the intricate course of globalization has woven new threads of economic thought emphasizing that historical understanding can serve as a compass for navigating an unpredictable future and before we start uh, with our today's event and hear the author and discussants lead the discussion for our viewers i would like to briefly introduce the author and our today's featured speaker professor harold james professor harold james is an eminent economic historian who specializes in the field of global economic history history of germany and european studies he is the claude and lord kelly professor in european studies at princeton university and is also the professor of history and international affairs at the university's Woodrow Wilson School. Professor James has extensively written on the economic and financial history of Europe and now deeply focused in working on the economic implications of globalization, uh, drawing comparisons with historical attempts at globalization to the modern times. He's the author of several award-winning publications, which are also outstanding contributions in his fields, of which I would just name a few. Reich Bank and Public Finance in Germany, 1924 to 1933, uh, Role of Banks in the Interwar Economy, and Making a Modern Central Bank, the Bank of England, 1979 to 2003. He's the recipient of 2004 Helmut Schmidt Prize for Economic History and 2005 Ludwig Erhard Prize. He's the official historian of the International Monetary Fund and is also a contributor to Project Syndicate, regularly writing a monthly column on various is issues of world affairs, including economic history. It is a great pleasure and honor to have you with us uh, today, Professor James, to welcome your fascinating new book, along with our other two distinguished panelists, Professor uh, Neil Ferguson and Sharon O'Halloran, whom I would introduce a little later in the session today. So without further delays, I would now like to pass on the floor to Professor James for his opening remarks. Uh, Professor James, the Zoom floor is yours, sir. Well, thank you so much, uh, Sumavar. It's uh, just great to be with you again. Um, and uh, I very much enjoyed the last discussion that we had of uh, Charles Mayer's uh, book. Um, uh, so I'm going to try to slide share some slides. Uh, you can see that. Wonderful. Uh, it's visible, yeah. Um, so indeed, uh, this is a book on the history of globalization, not the long history of globalization, because in some ways, I think you could tell a story of globalization that goes back thousands of years. And we know from archaeology, for instance, that there were skeletons uh, buried in southern Italy and in Sicily uh, that have Asian DNA and uh, skeletons on the coast of Vietnam and on the coast of China with European uh, DNA. And so there must have been some kind of global connection then. But I'm not, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the globalization of the modern period that really began um, in, the, in the middle of the 19th century. Um, and I, I wanted to think about this uh, because it seems to me that we've got at the moment a rather confused way of thinking 
about where we are. We're obviously in many ways in a deeply tragic moment in history with new conflict, um, but we're also at a moment when there's an enormous accelerated pace of technical change in IT and uh, artificial intelligence and the applications of that in medicine and uh, education and uh, many, many other fields. And the markets don't know really what to make of this. Uh, sometimes the narrative about global fragmentation is predominating. Sometimes the excitement about technical change, sometimes the worry about government's fiscal situation so it's 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 a very confusing story. Uh, and the message of my book is that this is actually not altogether new, uh, but that we've been at exactly these kinds of moments before uh, when the world is confusing, when on the one hand, it seems to be breaking apart. And on the other hand, the technology is tremendously promising and offers a vision of a quite different future. Um, and at those moments, I think uh, we have all kinds of, apocalyptic ideas of the end of globalization or the end of stable money or the end of capitalism or the end of macroeconomics, the end of everything. Um, you know, there's an anecdote that I tell in the book uh, it, just after I arrived in Princeton in October 1987, uh, there was a really tremendous stock exchange crash, which almost nobody remembers today. Um, but in October 87, the market fell by almost exactly the amount that it fell in October 1929. And the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal uh, put on their front page the curves from 1929 and the curves from October 1987 and said, you know, this is this is the end of the world. And um, I went into the courtyard just outside my building in Princeton and uh, you know, I was a really junior person then. Um, and uh, you know, then I saw two older people talking and uh, one was uh, the uh, really wonderful uh, historian Arno Meyer, um, and the other, this giant of a figure, six foot seven tall, uh, the former just retired as chairman of the Fed, um, Paul Volcker. And, uh, Char uh, and uh, Arno, Arno Meyer was, uh, ha had always a, a wonderful, uh, very Marxist interpretation of history, and he he looked at Paul Volcker and says, this is the end of capitalism, isn't it? And uh, Paul Volcker looked at him and sort of smiled slightly and said, mm, just a very ambiguous, mm, but the implication, I don't think so. Um, it, we're, we're at that moment at, the, at, at present. And uh, so Peter Navarro, uh, who used to be a tremendous free trader and a big advocate of more international communication, and more interconnectedness as President Trump's uh, trade advisor uh, put a very radically protectionist agenda. Um, and after the outbreak of COVID uh, said that COVID was the, the punishment for globalization and uh, that globalization was the original sin. Uh, so there was an almost theological uh, perception of what was going on. And that kind of theology about what, what's happening in the economy is, is often the characteristic of these uh, disturbed times. I mean, more soberly, um, the CIA director, uh, William Burns, uh, talks about this as being a plastic moment with deglobalization, supply shocks, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the escalation of threats to Taiwan. And he spoke before the, uh, the Hamas attack, uh, but he could equally have mentioned uh, the Hamas attack on October the 7th. Um, the world is dividing into blocks, fragmentation. Uh, Janet Yellen coined this term friendshoring. Uh, and then this year, she's been steering a little bit back on that. And it's called de-risking now. Um, and so less of a thought of really breaking up the world, but also uh, big inflation shocks. And uh, we've just as we speak, we've had a, uh, a government and a political system in Argentina uh, voted out because fundamentally of its inflation record. Um, so 
I wanted to try to put this all in a longer term context. When does globalization take off? Uh, when does globalization recede? Uh, there are various versions of this chart. It's, it's I think, a well-known chart in different forms. Um, this is taken from a nice book by Katow and uh, Mori Obstfeld. Um, but you can see in it, I think, that there are two big surges in globalization uh, as measured in this way as the ratio of global exports to GDP. Um, you know, that may, may not be a completely adequate measure of globalization and it obviously depends on things that are a little bit extraneous i mean for instance it's a measure of value uh, and so each time there's a big increase in energy prices this ratio of global exports to gdp is going to rise so this is what happens in the 1970s or what happened um in uh, the, the aftermath of the um February 24th attack, uh, 22, um, when energy prices rise, uh, the value of world trade rises, although actually maybe less is, 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 is moving. Um, or you might also say uh, that at some moments there are more countries than before. So uh, after the First World War, there were a few more countries uh, in the 1960s and 19. Uh, 1950s, 1960s, uh, there are many, many more countries as a result of decolonization. Um, and that, that's obviously going to increase the amount of international trade as well. But th th this is a kind of rule of the thumb guide. And you can see two moments, the middle of the 19th century and the 1970s when globalization really takes off. Um, and you can also see, I think, uh, how globalization is interrupted uh, by the First World War, um, there's a kind of literal recovery in the 1920s, a ephemeral recovery in the 1920s before the world is plunged into the Great Depression. And um, then uh, trade remains at a relatively constant level um, until the 1970s, uh, a little bit of a pickup immediately. Uh, after after the war in the early 1950s, but it's it's not a big story compared to the story that follows at the end of the 20th century. In the book, and this is really the the slide that I think uh, is my picture postcard version of the message of the book. Um, in that slide, um, I try to discuss these moments at which globalization turns in a particular direction. And the key to the book is that I want to make a distinction between supply shocks and demand shocks. And uh, you know, this might seem a little bit crude and it's in a way very basic uh, as a economic story, as economics 101, uh, so, so to speak. But um, it's, it's quite easy in, in observing, in, in, in theory at least, uh, to distinguish between a supply shock and a demand shock. Because in a demand shock, if we take a negative demand shock, uh, then the prices are falling and the volume of goods sold or the volume of goods produced are also falling. So that's the Great Depression. Um, and prices and output or prices and trade move in the same direction, or you can think of a positive supply shock when prices are rising and uh, demand is rising and output is rising. Uh, but the supply shock is really different to that. Uh, in the supply shock, the prices and the production or the uh, amount of trade move in opposite directions. And so um, this is the case in the two big negative supply shocks that in a way, are the focus of my story um, in the middle of the 19th century and in the 1970s. Uh, so uh, prices are rising, uh, but consumption, production, sales are falling. Um, and it's worth going back, I think, because it does seem to me that that is exactly the story that we're fundamentally in, um, in the world after 2020, after COVID. So this is also categorizable as a negative supply shock. And I've highlighted uh, 
those moments in uh, in red uh, on uh, this this chart. Uh, so this story begins with the food shortages in Europe in the second half of the 1840s and the way that I think uh, we remember it most in the United States. Um, and, uh, you know, in a way, it's 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 a particular nice coincidence where Sharon is based at the moment, because uh, this is a world uh, where you can think of this supply shock, at least, um, as the Irish potato uh, crisis, the, uh, the, the potato famine, um, the catastrophe of the 1840s. Um, writ large, and it, it was a particularly severe in Ireland, of course, uh, with uh, rainy summers, uh, low temperatures, and then uh, the fungus that rots the uh, potato. Um, and this is in Northern Europe as well. It's in Belgium, it's in uh, the, the British mainland, um, it's in Northern Germany. Um, terrible summers, uh, crop failure, and uh, many people in many countries, uh, but Ireland particularly, dependent on the potato monoculture. And uh, then what happens is a story of a government failure, a complete government failure. It's very beautifully uh, told in a new book uh, by the uh, economist, economic historian, uh, Charles Reed. Um, so at first the British government supplies food, uh, but then uh, the supply by the British government, it involves a deterioration of the balance of trade, um, it involves a deterioration of the budget position, and then on orthodox economic lines, uh, the British government says we can't do this anymore, and so they stop it and they make the potato famine uh, much, much worse. Uh, but this is everywhere, that governments really failed in this situation. Um, and the perception uh, then quickly turns around uh, to the idea that actually Europe can't feed itself. Uh, it needs to trade with the rest of the world in order to supply its food supply. And in the 1850s and 1860s, there's a great push to trade liberalization. Uh, and it's it's really forced by the legacy of this catastrophic experience of the um, food shortages, the hunger, the negative supply shock, if we want to put it in economic terms, uh, of the 1840s. Um, one other thing worth pointing out, I think, and it's, it's essential to the argument of the book, uh, is that in these moments, what happens is that technologies that were already there get taken up and used to maximum effect so that the globalization after the middle of the 19th century depends on the steam engine, the railroad in opening up continents and the steamship transporting goods across the oceans. Um, but the steam engine is an old invention. There were steam engines in the early 18th century. Uh, the big patent of Matthew Bolton and James Watt is in the 1770s, actually in the year of the Declaration of Independence in 1776 is also the year of the steam engine patent. Uh, but the steam engine is used in fixed positions to pump water out of mines most characteristically and in tiny, tiny little railways. So the first British railway between Stockton and Darlington or the first German railroad between Nuremberg and Fürth. I mean, these are fun things to have uh, but they're not transformative. But what happens after the 1840s is that you see the transformative potential and you get networks and uh, you get a uh, big expansion of trade as a result of a technology already there being taken up. And that is exactly, it seems to me, what happens in the 1970s. So if you jump forward to our next uh, red marker on this this slide uh, the oil shocks of the 1970s the first shock uh, in the aftermath of the yom kippur war in 73 and then the second after the iranian revolution in 1979 uh, so you know again the, the characteristic of a supply shock and again what happens is at first uh, 
uh, it, it paralyzes governments and governments deal with this very badly and some turn to a kind of protectionism in order to respond to it. Um, but uh, then by the end of the 1970s, there's a realization that actually you, you can do something else, you can open up. And so many, many countries and uh, you know, I see Charles, Charles Mayer on the Zoom and uh, Charles has written uh, with, with Neil Ferguson on the 1970s as a turning point, that's absolutely right. Um, when countries decide to open up, probably most significantly in the historical legacy, the opening up of China in that period. But again, the technology that's taken up that is transformative in the 1970s is an old technology. It's the container ship. And there were container ships in the 1930s. Uh, from the 1950s, there's a regular container line between New York, the port of New York, and um, Florida, but it's not a network. And it's only in the 1970s that you get the facilities that allow the construction of container ports all over the world. And the suggestion is that COVID uh, does exactly that, uh, that we have, as a result of supply shocks, and we saw COVID, what COVID does is to shut down world trade for a bit and creates a supply shock, creates shortages that then also feed into the escalating geopolitical tension. Um, but this is also a moment when technologies that are already there get much more widely disseminated. Uh, so the mRNA, mRNA vaccine um, essentially developed in the 1990s, uh, but it's only thought about as a potential solution to relatively rare tropical diseases. And then uh, after 2020, you see very, very quickly how it can be applied against the uh, COVID virus, uh, coronavirus, uh, and uh, then Quite quickly also, you see uh, that it's not just against COVID, but it can be applied in the case of many, many uh, common, but really deeply dangerous illnesses, in particular, uh, many forms of cancer. Uh, but the COVID uh, uh, crisis also gives technology a boost, uh, other kinds of technology. Uh, you know, what we're doing at the moment, a teleconference, uh, people could do that before 2020. They did do that before 2020, but it's not nearly as widespread as it is now. And uh, it's transformed the character of work and where people live. So it's 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 really uh, transformative. Um, uh, so you know, those are the three supply crises, negative supply shocks that, in my opinion, in the past have and in the future will push for more globalization rather than less globalization. Let me just add one thing, um, because each chapter of the book dealing with each of these seven moments um, has also a section that takes one particular figure, uh, one economist or economic analyst. The first is Karl Marx uh, for the crisis of the 1840s. Um, it, it takes an economist and thinks of the way in which economics changes in response to these particular uh, shocks. And uh, what I want to do also is to show how demand shocks produce a very different kind of economic response to supply shocks. In demand shocks, it's very obvious what has to be done you need more demand, you need fiscal stimulus, uh, you need monetary policy stabilization. Uh, so the great figure uh, in this is John Maynard Keynes uh, in the 1930s and the revival then of Keynesian thinking, what Robert Skidelsky referred to as the return of the master in 2008. And the solutions are indeed correct there, uh, that they're Keynesian. Um, but when you have a supply shock, that doesn't apply. Uh, because you don't want more aggregate demand. And in some ways, this is part of the problem of 2020 that we're living with now, that the solutions in 2020 are flawed because they think at first that it's a repetition of the last crisis of the 2008 uh, global financial crisis. It's not. Um, and you can't simply get more medical equipment, more face masks, more gowns, more vaccines, more glass vials to transport the vaccines in, or you can't deal with the other bits of the 
crisis that we're in at the moment. You can't get more military equipment. You can't get more drones. You can't get more surveillance equipment. You can't get more rounds of ammunition for the guns, the, the, the tanks uh, that you need in, in Ukraine. Uh, you, you can't get that just by spending money. It needs to be quite focused, quite specific. Um, and uh, in each of the cases of the supply shocks, what happens is that there's a shift away from thinking about macroeconomics and a shift to thinking about microeconomics. And uh, I, I uh, I, I, I like this story because it's got a nice coincidence about it. Uh, Karl Marx is working out what went wrong with the world in the 1850s and 60s. He's going every day to the British Museum, the library of the British Museum, um, writing out columns of figures from the newspapers and trying to think about how they match up. And at the same time, uh, Stanley Jevons uh, is working in the same room and really producing a new kind of economics, marginal economics, and indeed also giving economics its modern name, the discipline of economics its modern name rather than political economy. Uh, but that shift from big thinking, um, big thinking in aggregates to thinking about specific microeconomic adjustments at the margin is, I think, one of the intellectual characteristics that we have in the aftermath of supply shocks. So it's a question of governments adjusting. It's a question of the adjustment of financial structures, business structures. The world changes after supply shocks, but it's also a question of the change of thinking. That's uh, fundamentally in one slide is the book that I wanted to present. Yeah, th thank you. I will stop sharing now. Thank you so much, Professor, uh, for providing a wonderful overview of your book and uh, also highlighting your uh, significant researches over all these years. And uh, you have indeed opened a lot to discuss and talk, which we would definitely carry it on. Uh, and so uh, with this, let us move on to our uh, distinguished panelists in the panel uh, for their uh, uh, commentary. And I would like to start with our first uh, panelist, and uh, it is uh, Professor uh, Sharin O. Halloran. So, uh, Professor Sharin O. Halloran is the George Blumenthal Professor of Political Economy and Professor of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. Uh, a political scientist and economist by training, Professor O'Halloran has written extensively on issues related to the political economy of international trade and finance and economic growth and democratic transitions. Her impactful publications include Politics, Process and American Trade Policy, The Future of the Voting Rights Act and After the Crash, Financial Crisis and Regulatory Responses. She has served on numerous local community boards and professional academic uh, and welfare institutions such as American Political Science Association, American Economic Association and Community Impact. It is a great uh, privilege to have you with us today, Professor. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I just wanted to start and say that I very much enjoyed uh, reading the book. It is extremely well written. It's uh, very, uh, it, it's very discursive and en engaging, and it provides a well-crafted accounts, not only of the events, but also of the opinions and the views of the crisis as they unfold over these two centuries. And it's as much as an intellectual economic history as, much as it is a discussion about the events and their impacts. Now, this is a very, very macro view and a very, very engaging book that deals with complex issues. So I'm gonna highlight just three small, three points. And the first is that the book analyzes or categorizes the crises in terms of supply, demand or price events, as you saw in that elegant chart that was just presented. Uh, and I, I wanna argue that these categories, so whether it's a supply or a demand uh, or event, is really a symptom and not the causes of the crises themselves. 
Instead, I see the common denominator that's shared amongst all these crises as the misalignment or mismanagement of risk and uncertainty, sort of the misalignment between price and risk. And second, I want to raise a, a question of the case selection. Uh, now, this is you're already looking at seven cases over 200 years, so it, it's it's hard to say you need more or or less. Or, but I just I just wanted to say that some of these cases, while they're all they're very momentous, some of them are neither the most impactful or the determined or the most determinative of globalization. And I'm going to go through some of the cases, and then I'm going to discuss my first point about the risk and uncertainty in light of some of the cases. And third, and despite the differences in, in our views of cause, uh, I think we agree completely is that those countries that fared the best or were the most resilient in these crises were those where they had the institutions that were flexible enough to counteract the adverse impact of the crisis. And so in many ways, I see this as a very strong case for a political economy story. So let me just start with the, the famine. As you say, I, I sit in Dublin, and uh, as everyone would know, the this is the home of the potato famine. You had a million people who died as a result of that, and then two million that also, that just emigrated. And indeed, this was a, I, it's, it was, it, the famine itself then led to a supply, a supply crisis, right? So that was what we saw. But the famine wasn't caused by a supply crisis. It was a result of years of mismanagement of risk, right? We all know that a single crop economy is more risky and less able to handle different types of external uh, shocks, whether they be weather or a fungus or so forth, the more diversified countries. And so also we have to look at some of the policies that were in place that led to those types of inefficient uses of agriculture, the failure to develop more robust techniques, a better use of land, and so on. But I want to raise a question of besides that, that being the, the what I see as the cause, is there was also another famine in the uh, 19th century, the famine that we saw in 1873, 1876, 78, that impacted greatly China, India, and Brazil. And while the, the effect of the 1840 famine was extraordinary and significant, uh, the, in this case then, in the second one, we had estimates of 30 to 60 million people had died. So I guess I wanna ask why one famine is more important than the other, if that's not quite the right way to say it, but why I would choose one famine over the other and what was the criteria in making those choices. The second crisis that we looked at was the long depression, right? And this was the US and Europe, uh, it, it impacted the US and Europe really for almost a decade. and. It started as a default by a US railroad company on a British loan, right? In many ways, it was an asset bubble that led to a liquidity crisis, right? And in this case, then you had the speculation around the railroads and the, the ability of the, those investments to actually be returned to get the return on investment and a misplacing or misallocation of risk and price, okay? So in that case, then uh, the, the railroads became the 18, you know, the, the speculative bubble, bubble of, the, of that century. And it was just like sort of the dot, dot com. So that's one case. The next case then is we look at World War I and you had a loss of two, 20 million people that led to hyperinflation. And in many ways in your story, story, one of the things that you note is the uh, development of a new technology, the submarine, right? And, the, and it turns out the, the uh, Germans had a advantage in that technology. 
And so this is a case where a technology that gets developed and implemented poses a significant geopolitical risk. They saw that they could actually use a blockade and prevent uh, any trade from taking place within with Britain, and that this would be a very short war because they would be able to, in essence, starve the British. Well, it turned out not quite to be the case because they wind up uh, Bomb, you know, sinking one of the U.S. ships and they became involved. And that led to a very long, very protracted and very, very deadly war. And uh, I think then this leads to the hyperinflation and the development of a, a German economy and all of the, the, the concerns around capitalism and so forth that take place. And so when I see that, I wonder why don't we also talk about World War II, which lost 75 million people if you take into account both military and civilians. And by your own graph shows that this really was the start of what we consider the modern period of globalization. Also with the span with the World War I, the Spanish, uh, the Spanish flu killed what is estimated to be 50 million people, which has to be considered one of the largest pandemics that we've we've ever experienced. And uh, again, this is a uncertainty event, right? An event that governments were not able to respond effectively to. You could say they didn't have the technology, but again, uh, if, if we think of the institutions, their ability to rise to the challenge and meet these types of global events, we need mechanisms in place to be able to manage these. Then we had the Great Depression, where we have in the US close to 25% of the workforce becomes unemployed. And this is a, you know, a demand side effect by all accounts. But really, this the cause was a risk event, right? It was the crash, the mar stock market crash of 29, that led to a series of bank failures and bank runs. Uh, you had the introduction of very restrictive trade policy than Smoot Harley. Uh, you had government policies that just exasperated all of the downside effects of the demand collapse. And then you had the collapse of the monetary system. So again, while it was it 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 manifests as a demand uh, side effect, the instigation was a mismanagement of risk and the speculative effects around the stock market. The 1970s again is a supply is what you see is a supply crisis, and you have unemployment rising to about eight and a half percent. And this again is really commodity prices and shortages, right? Is what you're looking at. And I guess one of the other issues in the picking this crisis, and I can understand why you would pick this crisis, say over the 1980s. Uh, economic crisis where you had the, the savings and loans and other types of uh, events that took place. But in their 19, early 1980s, you had a recession that yielded unemployment almost 10%, right? And then subsequently in the later later 87 and, 18, and 1987, and so you had the savings and loan crises. So I just wonder again, I'm picking my cases, why one as opposed to the other? And then you have uh, obviously the financial crisis, 2008, 2009, unemployment rises to 14%. This again is an asset bubble, right? A misalignment of risk and pricing risk and being able to deal and manage with uncertainty. And then finally, we have the pandemic. You have 7 million people die. And it's clearly, this is seen as a, this is again, while it has a supply effect, Right. Everything gets landlocked. Everything, the, our supplies, our supply chains. What it shows is our supply chains aren't aren't really reliable. That in fact, using single points of uh, a production and then distribution isn't really a good a good reliable resilient way to handle things. And not being able to manage these risk events lead to that supply, uh, that supply event. So in all of these cases. I see, I agree exactly with whether it was a supply or a demand event or both, but I believe that the cause 
was really a fundamental misalignment of uh, price to risk and uh, government and government policies that in fact were not managing risk and uncertainty appropriately. So with that then, I think the a question moves to, and this is not is is not different than it's it's not it's sort of taking your your work your absolutely fabulous pay book and moving it forward and ask how can government manage the risk and uncertainty of a global economy, and I think that then becomes the new research agenda from where your work leaves off, and it's the next set of analysis that we need to take up. So thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, so uh, Professor James, would you like to respond or uh, should we, yeah? Well, I, I'd, I'd be very happy to re respond, but I, I I don't know what you would prefer, whether you would prefer uh, Neil to speak first, uh, but I'm, I'm I'm very happy to, to to say something. Maybe I should just say a few words. Yeah, yeah, uh, sure. Because it, it was just a fantastically interesting set of comments. And, uh, you, you know, I think, uh, you know, you know, I, I, I don't disagree with with the comments, and I think you're you're really right. I mean, I, I took these turning points um, uh, basically from the chart, um, as it were. So uh, the 1840s, because this is the moment that um, modern globalization takes off, and uh, yes, indeed, uh, the. Uh, the, the the famine of the 1840s is a tragedy, but it's less tragic uh, if you just measure it in quantitative terms than other 19th century famines or than the great famines of the 20th century, than the Bengal famine or uh, the, uh, the, the, the great hunger in China, uh, which is uh, surely the most destructive of human famines. And, you know, in, in a way, I think I could probably have produced a story that the the famine in China uh, in the long run causes the political repercussions that lead to Deng Xiaoping uh, taking an abrupt turn, of course, in the late 1970s. But um, but the, the the immediate shock, I think, for the 1970s uh, was the the shock of the oil price uh, events. Um, and uh, the uh, you know the first and second world war uh, yes i mean i took the first world war as a separate event and i found it actually hard to fit into the scheme in the sense that it's both a supply shock and a demand shock um so it it it, it, it doesn't really figure as neatly and indeed the direction of globalization is uh, uncertain after that uh, the second world war um i i did want to think about but uh Fundamentally, it seems to me to be an outgrowth of the Great Depression, and uh, you know, there's there's always a discussion also about when the Second World War began, uh, and uh, you, you know, I, I, I sometimes feel that it's wrong to say that the Second World War began on the first of September, nineteen thirty nine, with the German invasion of Poland. I mean, in some ways. It either begins with the Japanese in Manchuria in September 1931, uh, or it may be later with the, uh, the, 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 Chinese, the Japanese attacks uh, uh, later on in 37. In, uh, um, but the Second World War uh, is, and I think it's seen like that by the people who remake the international system in 1944 and 1945, it's seen as the outcome of the depression. And Henry Morgenthau, uh, I think, puts it very, very elegantly and very beautifully uh, that he he says, you know, the lesson we have to learn is that prosperity, like peace, is indivisible. You can't have prosperity in one country alone and let the rest of the world go to hell. Uh, you can't have peace in one country alone. You can't pretend as the United States did in the 1930s, that you can be an isolated island uh, when the rest of the world is being submerged uh, by, by fascism and uh, radical nationalism. Uh, so the, the world is interconnected. And that was the lesson that was very powerfully uh, learned. Um, you know, I, I mean, I think the case selection question uh, 
really also raises the issue the, 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 you know clearly uh, you're right the, the um these shocks don't come out of the blue and in some ways the uh the 1840s shock is a little bit different than the 1970s one in that the 1840s one is indeed i think a miscalculation uh, that is uh, and there's there's really a very very interesting uh, irish literature on this uh this is a, uh, nice pieces by Cormac or Greta, um, uh, that uh, you know, people were worried about the monocrop and the dependence on a monocrop, uh, but they also calculated what the probability was of a dramatic failure, and uh, it, it, it just way exceeds the, the kind of calculations that were made about resilience and stability in the early 19th century, in the same way, I think, as the, the calculations about stability in the financial system were miscalculated in the 1990s and the 2000s. And you thought, well, there might be a radical possibility of a dramatic crash, but you know that's something like a one in 10 million years event, and it's, it's not going to take place. And you realize that the, uh, the, the assessment of the risks was misplaced, but you realize that afterwards. Um, so uh, you know, I, th I, th I think the, the the question of risk assessment is indeed uh, crucial, and uh, you know I I, I think uh, the uh, you know the sketch that you gave for a research agenda, what makes for resilience and what makes for learning and effective policy and effective structuring of uh, businesses or of the financial system. Is indeed a theme. I mean, I, uh, you know, to some extent, this is uh, also a, a dialogue that I, I've had uh, over years with um, my friend and Prince and Marcus Brunemeyer, who's written just a, a wonderful book on resilience and how to how to how to make systems resilient. And in the sense, uh, you know, that that is also sketching out a research agenda uh, for the future. L let me leave it at that and come back to some of those points, if I may, after after Neil's spoken. Sure, Professor. Uh, uh, so now we would uh, like to go to our uh, other panelists. Uh, uh, so who is none other than Professor Neil Ferguson. Uh, Professor Neil Ferguson is the Milk, ba Milk Bank Family Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University and a senior fellow at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard University. He's a world acclaimed historian who writes and lectures frequently on international and global history, economic and financial history, and the history of British Empire and American imperialism, which is something he likes the most debating on. And uh, he's the author of 16 best selling and award winning books to name a few the Ascent of Money, A Financial History of the World, Civilization, the West and the Rest, uh, the, uh, the Square and the Tower, Networks, Hierarchies and the Struggle for Global Power, and his most recent, Doom, The Politics of Catastrophe. He's an award-winning filmmaker too, having won an international Emmy for his PBS series, The Ascent of Money. It is a great privilege to have you with us in this discussion, Professor Ferguson. And over to you for your reflections. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Sumava. And it's good to see you, Harold, uh, as well as my old friend, uh, Charles Mayer. And uh, good to meet you, uh, Sharon. Uh, I'll, I'll speak briefly so that we have maximum time for discussion. Well, who else uh, brings together economic history, political history, and intellectual history uh, with the deftness that Harold does? And over such a long time period, uh, too, it's uh, an impressive book and an enjoyable book to read. Uh, globalization was supposed to collapse uh, several times uh, in the last uh, few years. It was supposed to collapse uh, after the financial crisis. It was supposed to collapse uh, because of the pandemic. And uh, in his journalism, Harold kept pointing out that it was a little bit premature to write the obituary, 
Uh, and this book uh, develops some of the themes that he's touched on in, in recent years, uh, the extent to which uh, global interconnectedness may create uh, the potential for shocks, but then in response to the shocks, uh, globalization uh, shifts its shape and, and survives, or at least uh, re re resurrects itself. Uh, I, I think the key point about this book is to draw analogies between the, the recent disaster of the, the pandemic and other uh, shocks in the past. And uh, Harold elegantly divides them into supply shocks and demand shocks and suggests that there are very different responses to those different types of shock. Uh, one of the things I like a lot about the book is uh, that you get a different kind of economist coming to the fore uh, in a demand shock as compared with uh, a supply shock. Though it must be said that Larry Summers comes to the fore regardless of the kind of shock uh, that occurs. Uh, and you do uh, you do him some uh, some justice uh, showing the ways in which his thinking has evolved in response to these successive uh, crises. Um, the, the the big takeaway of the book is that 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 the crisis can elicit a response that's intellectual. Uh, it can also response uh, elicit a response that's uh, rather less cerebral, in which markets respond to the challenges by seeking to alleviate the constraints uh, and technology can in fact be adopted and disseminated more rapidly. So I, I, I've tried to summarize the argument there. Uh, it's a seven case uh, study book and the cases uh, go as we've already heard all the way back uh, to the 1840s come up to the present. Uh, Harold's uh, elegant uh, table that he presented in his uh, in his slide deck uh, summarizes it uh, in postcard uh, form, which will be useful for future undergraduates cramming uh, for overdue essays at Cambridge. Uh, Harold, as I suspect, uh, they still do. I want to uh, pose three questions, uh, and the first one is. Why not go back further? Uh, because economics goes back further. And it seems, uh, in a sense, somewhat arbitrary to start your narrative in the 1840s rather than in the late 18th century, uh, which was in many ways a time of globalization, even if it, it doesn't tend to appear in those charts that people love to, uh, to show us. Uh, if you read Tyler Goodspeed's excellent uh, history of the air bank crisis of 1772, you see that there was very clearly a global economy in the late 18th century. And uh, the shocks of that time, including the shocks emanating from global conflict, the Seven Years' War, um, were not only uh, shocks to the global economy, but they were shocks to uh, the Scottish Enlightenment uh, and the correspondence that Goodspeed quotes between Hume and Smith about the Airbank crisis is a kind of great starting point for the longer version of this book that you can publish that will be called Eight Crashes, and it'll include that one. And it'll be neater because you'll show that, that actually economic thinking begins with the kind of crisis uh, that, uh, that occurred then, forcing Smith to think hard about uh, the question of, of money and uh, banking regulation. So that's one suggestion, more than a, a question, really. Um, another reason for going back further is that you can then look at the Industrial Revolution uh, itself, which is uh, a kind of really obvious starting point for this, uh, this discussion, given the, the kind of more modern history uh, or historiography we have of the Industrial Revolution as in some measure a response to peculiarities of uh, of the British economy. I'm thinking here of Bob Allen's work. So that's my first uh, question. Why didn't you start earlier? The second question is shorter. Um, is, isn't the 1870s as much a supplier's story as a, a demand story? I, I guess I remember the Grosse Depression literature really being about uh, 
big changes in the relative prices of uh, of grain and, and steel. And I, I, I wanted you to kind of revisit that part of the book and convince me that it, it's best uh, classified as a demand shock. And finally, I wanted to ask a question about the last chapter. Um, I found the last chapter the least satisfying, actually, um, probably because I've uh, tried to write about it too, and that means I have certain preconceptions. But it, it seemed odd not to engage more directly with the central question of 2020, which is uh, the one that is being hashed out in the UK at the moment, but completely ignored in the US because nobody wants to have an inquest in the US. And the question is, were, were the lockdowns just a huge policy error uh, that uh, created an unnecessary, unnecessary supply shock uh, to very little good effect in terms of actually preventing the spread of the virus? Um, you know, the odd thing about the lockdowns is they never did anything like that in previous pandemics because they couldn't. And nobody talked about it in 57, 58, even though that was a pandemic that killed young people rather than just the elderly. COVID's really strange as a pandemic because it's so ageist. It discriminates against elderly people with relatively low loss of quality adjusted life years. Um, so you, you kind of leave that out. And, uh, and that just seems to me to be the big question about the, the disaster. It's really a man-made policy disaster more than it's uh, a public health disaster in, in my assessment. Um, I also found it kind of puzzling, and you can help me understand this better, Harold, how you get from the, the discussion of the lockdowns to a discussion of financial technology and financial fraud uh, in that last chapter, and I, I lost the thread of the chapter. I wasn't quite sure how uh, we got into, uh, you know, the the financial uh, skullduggery of of that post uh, or pandemic period. So help me think a little bit uh, about what 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 exactly you're trying to tell us about COVID, because by the end I was actually less sure than I was at the beginning of reading the book. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Professor. Uh, so uh, maybe Professor James would like to respond or uh, have any reflections here. Yeah. Sure, sure. Uh, thanks so much, Neil. I mean, that, that's you know characteristically brilliant, uh, the, the way that you put that. And um, you know, I, I, I think on the first point, uh, you are right um, that you know, this, this is a story that doesn't begin in the middle of the 19th century, really. But, uh, you know, we just have much better data on trade from the middle of the 19th century. So it's it's kind of convenient to start there. But if I was going to be really honest about it, you know, if I I, I, I sort of started with your, uh, your conception of going back a bit, I think I would probably start, uh, uh, you know, not not with the Roman Empire. We talked a little bit about the Roman Empire right at the beginning. Um, uh, but with the European uh, explorations of the 15th and 16th century and the opening up of the new world, and you know, indeed, uh, you know, that's what produces the, the 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 first major theoretical concerns, uh, the depictions of inflation, the the, the quantity theory of money. Uh, it's uh, Thomas Gresham and. Jean Baudin and uh, Copernicus uh, has, has a really beautiful uh, monetary tract. Um, so I, 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 th I think uh, you know I like the idea of of, of, of going back further, but uh, you know your suggestion about uh, you know, the, the particular background to Adam Smith's thinking is also interesting. And you know if if, if there were People, I, I, I would like to write about Gresham and uh, about Copernicus as, as, as well, um, and you know that that seems to me to be uh, uh, fascinating. Should you should you take the Industrial Revolution, uh, you know, the, the classical story of the Industrial Revolution? Um, uh, you know, I wonder. I mean, it's 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 obviously transformative for. Uh, for England and for English social history, um, uh, you know, I think actually mostly, uh, you know, I 
really deliberately use the word England there. Um, it, it's less Scottish, it's less Irish. Um, and uh, But it looks really, to me, actually not unlike, and um, Tony Wrigley used to make this point over and over again, that it looks not unlike what happened in the Netherlands in the 17th century. That is, that there's a, a very, very intense moment of urbanization and uh, there's a big application of new technology and there's a domination of export markets. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, what really happens, and, you, you know, that's, I think, where uh, I, 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 I find always... Uh, uh, Tony's argument, uh, E.A. Wrigley's argument, uh, absolutely convincing is that, you know, what was unique about the middle of the 19th century is that this was the moment that the world broke out of the Malthusian trap. Uh, it wasn't clear that it had done that with the industrial, so-called industrial revolution in England. It wasn't, it certainly wasn't the case that the Netherlands broke out of the Malthusian trap. Uh, but in the middle of the 19th century, you know, that's that's the essence of the Wrigley uh, case. It's the application of uh, uh, carbon energy, of fossil uh, energy, in place of human or animal labor. Uh, that is 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 really transformative, and that makes for you know. And that's why I wanted to begin the book also with the discussion of the Kuznets idea of modern economic growth. Uh, so I'm not sure that we're really in modern economic growth before. Uh, we're in really substantial growth in some areas of the world, um, in China, um, in uh, late medieval Italy, in the Netherlands in the 17th century, in the UK um, in the late 18th century. But it's not transformative in the way that the railway and the steam engine really make for this, uh, this, this, this transformation of the world. And so, you know, that would be my defense of the smaller version of the book and the longer version of the book. I mean, indeed, you're, you're right. It, it's, it really is worth thinking about and particularly the intellectual uh, history of it. Um, um, uh, so, um, uh, the, the, then, um, uh, you, you you had a second point, which I, I'm not reading very clearly because uh, the light is gradually fading where I am. I'm going to switch the, uh, the, the house lights on in a moment. Um, uh, but it, it's, I mean, it's, it's basically a question, as I understood it, about the 1870s and how we should understand the 1870s. Is it a demand crisis or... Yeah. I mean, actually, I, I, I see it really fundamentally as a positive supply shock. I mean, that's that's really what I get the the analysis of the uh, 1870s. That uh, you know, this is a moment when, um, uh, because of the the, the global opening, um, the, uh, the, the 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 price of goods uh, falls, and it, it's a it's a, it's a it's a positive supply shock, um, uh, uh, but uh, also then a, a question of a c collapse of demand after the outbreak of uh, speculative bubble. And I mean that 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 I think is is, is actually also the point that Sharin was making. Um, that that is that uh, there were these railway manias, and you know a bit like the dot com bubble, and uh, Sharon made that comparison really very explicitly. Um, in these railway uh, bubbles, um, you know you have multiple companies trying to do the same thing, and so trying to do the first transcontinental railroad in the U.S. or trying to open up uh, you know, the critical issue in Europe was getting access to the Romanian grain. Um, and uh, the company that gets there first uh, or captures the market first has an enormous advantage over the other companies, but you don't know at the beginning which is the company that is going to win. And so, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's got very, very precise analogies to the, uh, the dot-com uh, story, but it's driven again uh, by, I think the, the opening up of the markets, uh, but you know what happens then is a financial shock uh, that you know with these contagious crises. And I look at the uh, 
you know, first of all, the European variant of it that started in Austria in May 73, and then the US variant of it that starts later in the year. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, these uh, financial crises are really different uh, to the financial crises of the 1840s in that they immediately create the demand shock. Uh, you know, with the financial crisis, the, the, the structure of demand breaks down. And that's, that's why I, I, I put it in terms of that classification on the chart as a demand shock. But it, it should also properly be thought of as a, a positive supply shock. So it's the opposite of the 1840s. The, the world is, is abundant in the uh, 1970s, at least for Americans and uh, for Europeans. Um, and your uh, third question was about COVID and whether lockdowns were effective or not. And um, I, I mean, my, my, my response is to that is that I, I, I'm afraid I don't know. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure that we we can know yet. Um, we have some societies that didn't do much of a lockdown, uh, where you know, Sweden is always put there as the classical example of this, that uh, you know, had rates that were not inferior in terms of casualties to countries that did strict lockdowns. But in a sense, you know, this was a, a story that where um, it began in China. Uh, China did a severe lockdown, um, very severe lockdown. Um, at the beginning, if you remember the, the commentaries right at the beginning, everybody was convinced that China and particularly uh, small island countries, so actually Taiwan and New Zealand, uh, had very, very little in the way of casualties because they could they could do the lockdown really nicely in a small island. And so they look very good. Um, and, uh, you know, it's big countries where it was much harder to do the lockdown and uh, where it, it, I, 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 I just know, don't know. And in a way, you know, your point is a bit like Shireen's point uh, that I'm not examining the longer origins of these crises. Um, you know, all that I wanted to say was that this was a supply shock. I mean, it really clearly was a supply shock that the supply chains were interrupted because you know, in large part, uh, ships were in the wrong place. Uh, uh, crews were locked down. Um, uh, they couldn't load up. Uh, they were queuing. You know, you probably saw these photographs of the ships uh, lining up outside uh, Hong Kong Harbor or outside Shanghai. Um, everything was was kind of dislocated by that. And I think there's something there that, um, you know, I, 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 uh, I, I hope came out uh, clearly in the, in, the, in, the, in the text, which is that there's a, there's a kind of linkage, in my opinion. I mean, it's not that they're absolutely dissociated events between the COVID shock in 2020 and uh, the 24th of February, uh, 2022, in that, you know, what happens when you get worries about supply chains is that anybody who sits on top of the supply chain realizes that they can be politically used. And so if you're controlling in particular energy and you know every thought goes back to the 1970s and the way in which the energy is used then uh, as a way of doing a political blackmail and uh, you know, you're obviously thinking about how Henry Kissinger responds to this in the, in the 1970s. But you know, this, is, uh, you know, this, this, this is the moment that if you sit on energy, you can use it. And so, um, you know, you don't have to take the most obvious example of this, but, uh, you, you know, one that I thought was fascinating was that Algeria suddenly threatens to suspend its, its uh, gas flow to Spain uh, as long as Spain is sending gas to Morocco because Morocco and Algeria are locked in a conflict about the Western Sahara. And so, uh, you know, in order to to, to, to get some influence, some leverage, uh, Algeria realizes that it can use the gas. Um, and, you know, clearly the, the, the person who thinks that most, most obviously is uh, Vladimir Putin, um, that uh, the, 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 the Russian capacity to uh, influence the gas uh, flowing to Europe 
is going to be the thing that he thinks will uh, will allow him to uh, obliterate Ukraine from the map, and uh, that he will get away with it because he can uh, he can use the the gas weapon. And um, you know, I, I I think it's not even uh, too extreme, if I might say so, uh, to make a link between the twenty fourth of February last year and an event that obviously took place after the book was published, uh, the seventh of October. Uh, this year, um, incidentally, I mean, a fact that I think is not uh, uh, widely commented on is the 7th of October is the birthday of Vladimir Putin. Um, uh, so, you know, this is then an attempt uh, uh, by, uh, I, I think in particular, Tehran to disrupt a, a uh, a process in the Middle East that would have led to a de-escalation in the Middle East. So, um, you know, what you've got is one attempt after another to use supply chains uh, after 2020. And it's that that feeling that supply chains, are, uh, uh, the supply chains are vulnerable, uh, that you can apply leverage. And you know, there's a very, very nice book uh, uh, on this question of Getting with the bottlenecks in the world economy by uh, Henry Farrell and Dave Newman that's just come out. Uh, th 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 this is exactly the world is thinking in terms of supply chains, and um, you know that's that's also then finally you know why I get to this question of uh, you know what is the financial fraud that is most likely to occur in this era. Uh, you know you you concentrate on the thing that is nearest, and uh, you know what Lex Greensill wanted to do. Uh, you know, and I, I, I take in each episode some kind of big, big case of a financial uh, scandal. And what Lex Greensill promised to do uh, was to manage supply chains. Uh, you know, that, that's what he was good at. And he wanted to scale that up on a very, very big scale. And he was linked to the uh, way in which the British dealt with the, uh, the, the COVID uh, panic. Um, but it, it's exactly the promise. This is a more efficient way of running supply chains. We can do a financing of supply chains that the world has really uh, forgotten about, and you know, that's that's why I put that uh, financial bit into the into, into that final chapter. So thank you. I should I should stop there. And um... thanks, Harold. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, so we again uh, like uh, we uh, finish the commentary part, and maybe we have a room for maybe. Uh, very few questions, maybe we can limit to two questions. So uh, I can see a hand in the participants uh, list and it is uh, uh, Professor Charles Smith, our obviously, our, uh, uh, so he, uh, thank you for joining us, Professor Mayer. Uh, yes, over to you for your question. Uh, well, it's a, it's a small but select group and uh, it's been a pleasure listening to it, especially I don't know Shireen, but I do know the others are good friends and uh, and also very thoughtful. Uh, uh, I have a, a, you know, I, 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 I haven't read the book and I've essentially tried to, you know, use uh, Harold's chart. Uh, I just wonder, you know, there, there are supply shocks. Uh, they are, as he presents them, in some sense, we define them as exogenous to the ongoing uh, system as it's been working up to that point, uh, even if they are obviously, as Shireen has said, and uh, Nilo said, they are, in, they, are, they are products of an earlier uh, stage in the system. Uh, I'd encourage uh, you know, Harold also to think about the 1837 uh, 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 shock in the United States when land speculation in the, in the, in the Mississippi West was very uh, was very great. But uh, my sense is we'd have had a series of crises at intervals, even without sh supply shocks. That there is something uh, endogenous about economic activity, which is probabilistic activity, uh, as it is, if you want to call it risk activity. And in all these cases, it seems to me, you, you know, or without the supply shocks, we'd have still had, uh, we'd still have had crises from uh, uh, from misevaluating the future. Uh, 
I, I, I often ask myself, what percentage of risk would it take to keep me from getting onto an airplane? Uh, I'm willing to do it at the current perception of risk, but if it went up to one percent, I'd, I'd, I'd probably be very, very reluctant. And uh, so I'm just thinking uh, we could write a story of uh, of crises. I think just on the basis of endogenous. Uh, expectations uh, about the future, the, and uh, the chance to make money in the present by speculating on the future. That's why I wonder whether uh, this the the, uh, the separation of uh, financial activity from production activity is really maybe we make it too absolute because in a certain sense it it is they're all expectations about the future. Uh, I, I look forward to reading this book, but I, you know, I, um, I, 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 this is just an alternative way of, of, of looking at things. And uh, I wonder whether uh, Harold or uh, any the other participants would like to comment on this. Uh, but thanks for this. Uh, thanks for this occasion. And thank you, Asimava, for organizing, uh, organizing it. And Harold, I don't know where you are. <laughs> It's someplace, I guess, where the light is fading. And I just put me in mind of the line by Clough, you know, but westward low, the land is bright. Uh, it's not very bright here today, but it is a, probably a little brighter. Thank you. Yes, indeed. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I'm afraid uh, I, I'm in Berlin at the uh, Institute for Advanced Study, the Wissenschaftskolleg. And right. uh, it's... Uh, you, you, you know, when you think about the light fading, uh, you, you know, I think, uh, you know, Neil is obviously an aficionado of this moment. Uh, you know, you think of this famous comment by Sir Edward Grey that the lights are going out all over right. Europe. I don't know whether we'll see them lit again in our lifetime or so, you know, something to that effect over Whitehall in the beginning of August uh, 1914. Um, but, but yes, I, 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 I mean, I, I, I think you, you know, your, your, your point is in a way a bit like uh, Neil's that it's, it's very, very difficult to know where to start. And you know, clearly, the 1840s is not the biggest or most important financial crisis of the 19th century. And uh, there is a financial crisis in uh, 1847, but it's not of the order of the earlier ones. And you know, you might want to go back also to 1825, uh, so the collapse of the first big wave of, of lending uh, in the aftermath of independence to the South American states. Uh, to the 1830s, you, you know, you're right about the, uh, the, the capital flows to the U US states. And um, so I, 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 I did exactly want to do what you correctly picked up, uh, is that I wanted to distinguish between financial crises, large-scale financial crises that on the whole produce demand shocks because they destroy activity, um, and these supply crises. So the 1970s, again, you know, you can find um, uh, little bits of banking crises in the 1970s. Uh, you can find the, um, you know, the UK had uh, this, this uh, so-called secondary banking crisis. Um, you know, the small German bank failed with uh, big implications for the international connectedness with the Hastat Bank. Uh, but, uh, you know, on the whole, the 1970s, uh, in the period of inflation, it wasn't really a period of big bank failures. The big bank problems come in the 1980s, uh, a, a decade later. And so this is really, um, you know, so, uh, I, I think uh, exactly described best as a, demand uh, as a, I'm sorry, a supply shock um, caused by the increase in the oil prices. But, um, you know, if you if you play the game of asking about the causes of that, um, then in a way you come back to something that is a bit like the some of the 19th century experiences that, uh, you know, why was the world so vulnerable in 1973? Um, it's because they'd had a big period of coordinated simultaneous expansion in the 1960s. And uh, so, uh, you know, everybody is expanding and everybody is putting their foot on the fiscal gas pedal. Uh, you know, 
Nixon is obsessed with getting re-elected in 72. Uh, the British are concerned with uh, building a white-hot economy. Um, uh, people are putting their foot on the monetary uh, gas pedal. Uh, they're not worried about inflation, even though inflation is taking up. And you know, if you're sitting there and looking at that as a oil exporter, you think, well, you know, we're pricing the oil in dollars and we're losing out because the dollar is worth less. And so let's let's coordinate a bit and uh, let's get together. And uh, I, I mean, I think uh, it would be right if you were telling the ultimate origins of the. Um, 1973 problem to go back to the 60s expansion, but you know, I almost deliberately don't want to get into the business of going into the long history of the origins of something. I mean, it's a, in a way a little bit like Neil's uh COVID question, and you know, was it really the right decision or not the right decision to do the lockdown? Um, I'm not sure about it, um, but you know, that's what happened, and that's why we got a supply shock. Uh, ultimately, there may be no long term. I mean, our origins are obviously a constantly go back. I I wonder whether the uh, the uh, uh, subprime crisis uh, is is to be is to be distinguished in this sequence. But anyway, uh, I'm uh, I, I will I will. But, it, but it's unambiguously a, a financial crisis. I think in two thousand seven, two thousand and eight, that the origins of it. I mean, again, you might say it comes from coordinated expansion that everybody is growing very quickly at the same time. And you know, when everybody is growing, you have less of a perception that things can be risky. And uh, so, you know, it, it it may have a little bit of that 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 kind of origin to it too. Thank you, Professor. And uh, so we are almost near the time. And uh, this question would be to all three of you, and we will wrap up with that. So, uh, so my question is like from the beginning of this year, we have been hearing, and this is not a speculation, rather, it's been observed by leading economic forums, I would say, that very soon we might be hit by a severe economic crisis in the world and uh, while it's difficult to speak on the nature of any uh, financial crisis in advance i would rather like to ask you what lessons we can take from history as history is what makes us build a more you know prepared future so my uh, first uh, so my question to professor james would be like we have recently been writing on how peace through trade is dead and uh, in the modern world and our our, our current world is leading to a more uh, war-prone international order, whether it's Ukraine or Israel-Palestine. Henceforth, the foresight of a worsened economic crisis cannot be denied. So what lessons would you like to highlight before the world leaders and maybe also the policy policymakers to tackle if there is a next boom in this war-tone you know, world uh, from your study of extensive study of history? Yes, sir. Well, I, I mean, I think we've got a pile up of debt, uh, and uh, you know, the moment that the interest rates start to turn, um, you know, so basically, uh, you know, what happened last year in uh, 2022, that the, um, you know, what happened in the UK uh, was in a way an indicator of the kind of stuff that can happen in bigger countries. And, you know, I think the reason that the UK in September last year was so much at the forefront of everybody's attention was that the UK was almost being used as a test case to see what would happen because you know big financial institutions exposed to uh, to, to bonds and uh, being very vulnerable when they have to sell bonds to meet liquidity you know, that was the position for the British pension funds but it's not just the British pension funds that are in that situation and everybody knows that there are there are many U.S. institutions that are like that. And indeed, you saw a version of it with uh, with Silicon Valley Bank. Um, so uh, that, 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 I think, is the is is the big threat. Um, it, you know, it's not in most uh, emerging market countries, it's not a question of big government debt anymore, uh, with exceptions. Uh, so the except, you know, the one big exception is just really blown up and uh, you know there will be a radical change of course in Argentina uh, as, a, as a consequence of the, the election on Sunday um, where you know, Javier Milla is, is 
is promising at least an answer uh, to a question that for 20 years uh, Argentine governments failed to solve. Um, but, but it's mostly not a, a government problem in the emerging market world. It is a government debt problem in the in the advanced economies, and it's a problem for the um, uh, United States as well. And you know, that's I think one of the reasons that this was this was focused on so intensely by Janet Yen and by Larry Summers uh, as it was taking place when the uh, experiment with Liz Truss and uh, Quasi Quateng was was underway. But that that is the kind of thing that is likely to happen in the future. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'd be, be interested to hear Shireen's view on that and Neil's view on this, but uh, we're, we're in a world where there's an awful lot of debt, uh, particularly in advanced uh, countries and from corporate debt in emerging markets as well. Yes. Uh, so same question would be to Professor Ferguson as well. Like, only I would like to add a, a small point, like you have extensively writing on the U.S.-China relations these days and the new Cold War, obviously. So how do you think the, and you, in, in one of your recent articles, you also mentioned that you think in the new Cold War, U.S. is the so Soviet Union. And uh, so, you know, like where, you know, uh, China has been always, you know, eliminated from the world stage by the West. So, uh, so how do you think the new Cold War might be a factor in this and how U.S. and Chinese administrations should approach in terms of economic cooperation? And if you could highlight our audiences on this, sir. Yeah. Well, I'll be very brief because we're almost out of time. Sure. I think one of the things one learns from uh, reading Harold's work, uh, including this new book, is that uh, nothing causes quite as much disruption to the global economy than war. Uh, especially large-scale war. Uh, and uh, uh, that's something that uh, Harold's chapter on the First World War makes very clear. But remember, it's also a big part of what happens in the 1970s. It's a big part of the inflation story. Uh, Harold sort of adds the Russia-Ukraine war into his chapter on COVID, but it's a completely separate crisis, really. Uh, and I think if if the US and China were to uh, end up in a war over Taiwan, which is not inconceivable, uh, the economic uh, and financial consequences would be on a massive scale. Uh, e even if the US and Iran had got into a war over uh, Israel and Hamas, that would have been very disruptive to not just oil markets. But the problem that Harold highlights of excess debt and in inflation risk would be greatly magnified if uh, geopolitical uh, uh, conflict were to escalate at any point in the near future. I I'll leave it there because it it's uh, it's half past the hour and we're yeah, so, almost entirely out of time. Yeah, definitely. So lastly, to Professor O'Halloran, maybe shortly you can uh, uh, provide some reflections as a political scientist and a political economist. How which yes. So I th I think I'll, I think corporate debt's a problem, but I also think the what you're seeing is the. Uh, I don't want to say replication of the housing bubble that went on in the 2009, because that would be very, I don't want to forecast that, but I think we're seeing a lot of that take place with these housing prices being so exorbitant. And while I don't think the debt is the same way, again, if the housing prices decrease by a lot, you still may have a lot of people underwater. And I think that that will be, will pose a significant problem. Uh, thank you so much, professors. And uh, it was a wonderful evening hosting uh, Professor uh, Harold James' uh, Seven Crashes. And it, it's indeed an excellent book. And I would uh, encourage the uh, viewers to read it and as well as uh, the policymakers too. It was a, a wonderful discussion with all of you. And uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, uh, and I wish everyone best for your upcoming projects. Thank you so much for joining. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.